We're going to read the first five verses, and uh, Galatians is a, a, a tremendous book, and, and one of the great things of understanding the Bible that I have, you know, was in teaching the Bible from a, a, a teaching standpoint is the Bible was not written in chapters and verses, okay? Those were put in 1,400 years later, so chapters and verses are not inspired. Some of them are good. Some chapters are put in, and it's an awful place to put it because it breaks the train of thought. Some chapters will begin with the word therefore or wherefore, which is connecting the previous statements that was said. So to get a hold of chapter 6 and verse 1, you do have to back up and see exactly what's taking place and what Paul is saying. Paul is talking to us about walking uh, in the Spirit versus walking in the flesh. It's two different walks. He's saying that believers can get involved in. This I say in verse 16 of chapter 5, walk in the Spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. That begins this run-on truth going all the way through chapter 6 and verse number 5. So understand that's the beginning of this thought. The Apostle Paul was writing to this church there in Galatians, and he takes this thought of walking in the Spirit versus walking in the flesh. There are two different... Now, you're talking about a Christian, and that Christian is feeding on two different things and walking in that. And so it backs up and and gets us to say, now remember, salvation is in three parts. Now, when I look at the New Testament and look at salvation... You've got the past application of salvation. The Bible teaches that's justification. You are justified. That's the moment God opened your eyes. You believed the gospel. You were justified, sealed, paid in full. Your sins was paid in full. That's past, present, future sins. It was paid in full by Jesus on the cross. And when you accept Christ and believe in your heart through conviction, and he opened your eyes to that, and you, you believe that, You are justified. But the Bible also talks about this present condition of the flesh. And it's called sanctification. And it is in the tense of I am being saved. All right? Now, you're justified. All right? Nothing can change that. You're sealed with the seal of promise. But now it's the sanctification process. And in that sanctification process, some people wander and they stay. And Paul was talking about some can live fleshly that he's saying here. And there's going to be marks of that. Or some can walk in the Spirit and there's marks of that. And when you're walking in the Spirit, it saves you from fleshly you know, uh, uh, repercussions of your decisions. Because if we make decisions in the flesh, we reap to the flesh. All right? So you can be saved from a lot of heartache by walking in the Spirit and not fulfilling the lust of the flesh because if you fulfill the lust of the flesh, it brings a lot of heartache and a lot of trouble to your life and to your family's life. And that's what this is saying here. And so, and then there's the future sense of salvation where the past is you're saved from the penalty of sin that's justified and sanctification. You're saved from the power of sin when we walk in the Spirit. And then there's the glorification where we will be safe from the presence of sin. Aren't you excited about that? We won't have to wrestle. We'll have a new body uh, glorified in the presence of God. But until then, there is decisions to be made every day of what are you going to walk in, that old English term of your manner of life. Walking is determining, it's it's character building, it's engraving, it is your character, it's how you're walking. You're walking either led by the Holy Spirit or you're being led by your flesh. And so he goes down and he says what that looks like. Now pick up in verse 6, and I'll go back and look at a few other verses in in chapter 5, or chapter 6 and verse 1. Now brethren, if any man be overtaken in a fault... You can underline that fault. The word in the Greek means any of the previous faults listed. So understand, no chapters and verses here. You really want to get a hold of the script. See, chapters and verses made us lazy. We'll read one verse and pull it out of context. That's the reason so much craziness is out there. 
You take a verse here and a verse there and a verse there and you don't look at it in this context. Brethren, if any person being overtaken, if any one of us Christians are walking in our flesh and we've been overtaken, the word means to be caught in a trap, tripped up. There's a statement that says like on the basketball team, if, if someone, if you got caught, not look and say, you got got. If somebody got got and sin got them. The sins in which he is talking about starts in verse number 19. Look what it says. Now the works of the flesh are these. This is the faults that someone could be caught in. And it's listed here. The word works of the flesh, the word works is a Greek word, mean occupation. It is the flesh's occupation that gets you caught in this. So if you think you got some deal with your flesh, you will fall on your face. It's illustrated. I told you, every New Testament doctrine is illustrated greatly in the Old Testament. Joseph fled from situation. He didn't try to stay and fight. Your flesh is weak, the Bible says. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So if any person's overtaking, in verse number 19, in adultery, in fornication, in uncleanliness, in lasciviousness. Those two words are interesting. Uh, those are words that describe those that would go to Greek houses in the cities of Ephesus, Galatia, uh, Thessalonica, and um, how can I say it tactfully? Um, it would be houses uh, found in Las Vegas in New York. And to think that you've got to go to some place like that now to get into uncleanliness and lasciviousness, these things called a cell phone has dropped us like. So things you can get into, un this is what this is talking about. Someone's got caught, trip. idolatry. That's wrong thinking about God. Witchcraft, we get pharmaceutical from that. Hatred, variances. Emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies. I don't have time to go through all those, but look those up. Envies, murders, drunkenness, revilings. The reason I read those is to understand that somebody in the household of fate has got tripped up on one of those. It means they're walking in the flesh, and it's got a hold of them, and it's, it's done some damage to them, their family, the body of Christ, the church. All right. Verse 6, how are we to react? We better hope somebody's walking in the Spirit up in this place. Boy, that's why we need Spirit-walking folk. Ye which are spiritual, restore such as one in the Spirit. Or does it say, you which are spiritual, send a prayer request for that individual through Facebook? <laughs> No, I don't say that. You ought to spread some stuff. You which are spiritual, you which are spiritual, get up and preach a sermon on that sin you know they just was guilty of where everybody thinks you. You which are spiritual, try to present yourself more. No, it says you which are spiritual, restored. Do you know that you and I are called into the ministry of reconciliation and restoration? The body of Christ is more than just coming here and looking at the back of people's heads. And saying, I didn't know that dude was that bald. Or I didn't know that they, or I didn't know that they, we're not just here for that. The, it's not just on Sundays and Wednesdays. The body of Christ is to help us walk in the Spirit. We are put here to, to push you and I into our destiny of walking in the Spirit of God. And that is why we're here. And I don't take the body of Christ lightly. It's not a game. It's not just the members. Oh, no, we're here to sharpen each other. And we do people disservice when we see them in their sin and we say nothing. We're here to speak life into people. You with your spiritual, restore. And let me say this, this false interpretation of the book of James, that someone caught in a fault and they stand up in the middle of a church service and tell everybody in the church what's going on in their life. You do that, you're crazy. <laughs> You post it on Facebook, you're crazy. Don't you say, pray for me. I just, no, don't you do that. 
Everybody's not spiritual in the church. That's the most crazy thing. No, ye which are spiritual. And so there's a, there's a group of spiritual people that's walking to restore such in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself. Lest thou also be tempted. Verse number 2. So I'm going to talk about being overtaken tonight and what to do there. But notice verse 2. Now these are all military terms, by the way. See, that walk, walk in the Spirit and walk in the flesh, there's a military regiment. There's some discipline involved in walking in the Spirit. All right? It's a military walk. It's discipline. And so he uses some military terms here, overtaken by an enemy. That's a military term that uh, the Greeks would use. But then he uses another one. But ye, uh, bear ye one another's burdens. That's also a military term of helping out carrying someone else's load. So we're going to talk about being overloaded. He goes on and look at verse number 3. For if any man think himself to be something, that's what a person thinks about themselves, actuality when he is nothing. (laughs) Can I put that in modern terms? When because I preach a sermon, I think I'm a blessing. But really, since I'm doing it out of my flesh, I'm a burden. Because I sing a song or play a guitar or play this, I think I'm a blessing, but really because my spirit's all jacked up, I'm really a burden. I teach a Sunday school class, or I come... Understand what this is saying. This Paul is saying that a lot of people's walking around thinking they're a blessing, but they're a burden. That's what he's saying. If any man think of himself something when he is nothing... That's what that's saying. When you think you're a blessing, but really you're a burden. He deceiveth himself. You ever met anybody like that? Don't look at nobody or raise your hand. But let every man prove his own work. Boy, where's that at? Let him prove, examine, be tested. Somebody tell me they can bench 315 pounds. All right, let's see it. Let me put 345s on each side, get you in a weight room, and let me see if you can bench it. You said you can bench it, now let me see if you can bench it. You ever had the weight room talk? Some of you in the gym, long, you know, yeah, I reckon, you know, my shoulders just hurt today. I normally I get it for you, but all those, let him prove himself. And then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. If you notice that word burden there in verse number 5, and the burden in verse number 2, those are two different Greek words. That's why it's good to look at the Greek. There's two different things there. I'll explain those meanings as we go through this. And that's people, it's over dramatic, my third point. So the first one, let's go back and talk about being overtaken. As long as we're here, we're all susceptible of being overtaken. As long as we're in this flesh, you walk in pride and you judge someone. There's some folks that's called me over the last month, said, man, you hear about so-and-so, all this type stuff. And yeah, I heard that before because, you know, everybody wants to give those prayer requests coming in to me. And and I heard that. You know what happened in my spirit? My spirit sinks when I hear that. You know, the devil's got a trophy case, don't you? You remember Saul when the... When the enemies killed Saul and they stapled him up on the wall. For the enemy, you know, our enemy wants to do that to us. He wants to take good folks out of the church, been there, a young pastor, there and just wreck them. He wants to send things and, and it just harms us all. When that happens, there's a, there's a harming that takes place. This is what this is talking about being overtaken. What in what fault? He just mentions a fault. That's that word. It's going back to those things it's mentioning in verses 19 and following. The business of this flesh is to get you tripped up. Remember, we got three enemies. The world, the flesh, and the devil. And it's presented out of the lust of the eyes, right? It's pride of life. It's lust of the flesh. We're tempted and drawn off by desire. So let me just say, it is an edible of importance for you and I to walk in the Spirit. I'm talking about every day. 
Every day in the Spirit. You say, what's some ways that I can walk in the Spirit and not be overtaken? Let me tell you right here in this day. Um, I'm reaching out to a young man that has been overtaken. Um, but boy, it'd be good if someone could reach out and be accountable. Number one, you need to get somebody accountable in your life. Someone that you can confess to. Someone that you can reach out to and talk and say, man, this is bothering me and this, is, uh, this thing's bothering me. Whether it's a jealous spirit or, or whether it's th this thing's but something you can open up to because let me tell you what we're good at in the church, covering it up and hiding it. And sooner or later, the Bible says your sin will find you out. Not that God finds you out. God sends mercy your way a whole lot of times. God sends us a lot of mercy to get that thing. God's not wanting to expose. Sin exposes us. Sin does not play fair. It gets people and keeps them deeper and longer, and it will expose itself. That's what overtaking is meaning here. That that sin has got a hold of them and ripped them down. And so there's means of necessary at this military turn overtaken. There's some things. Be aware. Be alert. Bible, uh, Paul tells us a lot of times, be vigilant, be sober, be watching because we have an adversary enemy uh, hiding in behind the bushes uh, waiting to get us. And that's this. He doesn't take no time off. <laughs> He's going to get you when you're at your weak point, when you're physically tired, when this has happened, when... Uh, you feel like an injustice in your life. You lost a job or someone got a promotion or whatever it may be. He will seize opportunity in our lives. If any man be overtaken in a trap, tripped up, ye which are spiritual, the imperative of you living a spiritual life is not just for you. <laughs> and it's not just for God, but it's for others. For me and my man, when we're talking and there's a guy that, you know, we feed off feet. That's what we do. We feed. We, we, we cry. We, we, you know, it causes, we know it's not just about us. I look at myself having to look at people in the church, look at my family. Look at, so you need to run, let that run through. Anytime I hear something of someone being overtaken, I put myself in those shoes and, and it, it, it gut wrenches me and I say, oh God. How dare us to lift our heads up and say, how could someone like that? You walked down that path long enough. And according to the text, and according to principles of Proverbs, that haughty spirit will get you fallen. And so we which are spiritual, you, you know, we walk spiritually and we deny the flesh and uh, we, we get in the Word, not just for ourselves and not just for God, but for others. Because see, this thing's talking about, in our, in our next one that we're going to look at is, not only do I got to carry my burdens if we're going to walk spiritual, and this is another reason we got to walk spiritual, not just uh, helping those who's been overtaken, but help carrying the loads of others. And so we got to be in physical shape, or let me say spiritually in shape, to carry others' burdens. And so ye which are spiritual is an imperative. Paul was saying there is someone that did not heed his warning and began to walk in the flesh. And now they've been overtaken. It's, it's impacted the church because there's no way that it was them. There's no way that was the one. That's what's happened here. And everybody's stepping back, and you've got people, uh, if they're walking in the flesh, now they're pointing because these people weren't guilty of that, but they're still walking in the flesh. And they can't provide no help. <laughs> and so someone needs to be spiritual to restore. The word restore is to mend. It comes from a, you know, it's a medical term of this day when an arm was broken and it was mended back. It was set, and there it healed. So I've broke my left arm playing sports three different occasions. One, I was showing off. I was a ninth grader and could slam a basketball, and so I was going to show everyone in the 12th grade how I could do that. And I did slam the basketball, and I was running full speed. I held onto the rim, and I shattered my wrist. It's restored, and here's what the orthopedic said. He said, man, that thing healed back right. You may break it again, but it won't break right there, the way it healed back, mended. 
What Paul is trying to say is, yeah, there can be scars, but you can be mended. People can be restored. And there is a restoration process that you and I are called to in the body of Christ. It's a ministry in Corinthians, he says, of reconciliation to restore. Man, what a spiritual name. And it says in the spirit of meekness. What a powerful word he uses. Strength under control. Gentleness. That is part of the, if you look in verse 23, see he's saying, but the fruit singular of the Spirit is this. When we're walking in the Spirit, we display those things. And people can come and open up and knowing that you're temperate and that you're meek, you're approachable. Long-suffering, there's a goodness there. And there's a restoration. And so there's a desperate call that Paul was saying to the body of Christ, all ye saints of God walk spiritual. Be in a place because you never know when that person's going to be overtaken and God's going to call on you to set that back in place where it can be restored. Some of you may be the very person that someone comes to that can restore and mend the family. <laughs> Maybe it's one of the first ones mentioned there that it involved the family. Or maybe it's a young person and they've been called and there's a mending there. Consider thyself, lest thou be tempted. Number two, so there's an overtaking there, it's mentioned. The second one's overloaded. Boy, is people not stressed out. Some, you know, I, I try not to watch much of the news. It's, it's, you know, it'll stress you out. I mean, it stresses me out, the, the, you know, some of the things you look at, and the stresses are out there, and just tensions are high, anxieties are high. Counseling's on, a, I mean, just at the high peak. People trying to find, I mean, just there's a lot of things here. And this is what it's saying, bear ye one another burden. Now, that word burden's interesting. It means heaviness and trouble. The word bear ye shared a load. And so... It's sort of like when uh, we're out over, I'm at the park, and, and it used to happen often years ago when our girls were smaller, and I'm carrying, uh, I remember we hiked to the top of High Brighton Mountain one time, and I took the girls, and about halfway up, Sadie was done. She's like, I'm done. I said, no, we got a long way. We're just hitting the, I mean, it's just now going to get hard. So guess what uh, Dad had to do? <laughs> I had to carry her the rest of the way up. And then halfway back down. Then I had to pick up the other one and carry her a while. I was, you know, sharing us, picking her up. Now, being in a place where you can not only carry your weight, but being in a place you can carry someone else's. And that's why we got to be spiritual, that we're not always maxed out. If you're in here tonight, and let's just say this is the margins of your life, and you're constantly living at the edge of your margin, and you're just constantly, I almost had a knock, man, I'm about to die with it. You're living right there. You can't carry nobody else's weight. You're barely carrying yours. And so there's a thing that Paul is saying is placing ourselves, you with your spiritual, you're going to help those who's overtaken, but you're going to help those who's overloaded. You can come in and you've walked in the Spirit. Yeah, we all got, you say, well, who are you? You don't have, but no, we all got weights. <laughs> we all got heaviness. It rains on the just and the unjust. But when we walk in the Spirit and you get spiritually strong. I remember when I, uh, I was first saved and I was saved under a guy named Daniel Buchanan. Now to go back to meet that meeting, when I first seen him, the principal at West Caldwell was trying to get me to go play football at East Carolina. He was a former East Carolina football coach for 20 years, Ed Emery. I said, I'm not going to play football. They're too big, <laughs> and they hurt people. I'm going to stick with baseball. I stay away from people, right? And this dude pulled up in my yard, and, and he was in an old Ford Tempo, and I seen the Ford Tempo. When he get out of the car, it literally lifted up four inches. This dude was huge, and I said, man, Mr. Emery sent this dude over here, and he comes to the door, and he says, oh, I'm Pastor Daniel, I'm Pastor New Jersey. Barely understood what he said. He's, he has a preaching voice when he talks. And so he came in, and, and anyway, he introduced himself, and long story short, about eight months later, uh, he had come and watched me do some stuff. I'd go hear him preach, 
And, uh, and I gave my heart to the Lord. I mean, he saved me. He opened my eyes. Well, he was in the weightlifting, and I was strength training. I thought, man, let me see what this guy's got. And we would go at 5 o'clock in the morning to a place in Lenore called the Spa. <laughs> we went in there, and he's starting to tape his wrist up. And I said, what's he doing that for? Now, the dude's in a, he's in a blazer. He worked out in long sleeves in a suit jacket. I was like, well, who does that? You know? He gets up under 315 pounds and just begins to just ease it up, ease it up. He goes over on these things. This big dude, he was over there, and he was doing these butterflies, and he was a monster, and he was, and he was one of them guys that hollered in the gym. He was just pitching a fit, you know, and he'd get up and look in the mirror and make sure that everybody was looking at him, and he was a big dude. But Pat Daniel goes over there. I don't know if he done it on purpose or not. And he takes it and drops it down about 80 more pounds. <laughs> and he starts slapping it together, listening to the primitive quartet uh, and a suit jacket. I mean, I'm like, unbelievable. The point I'm getting at is we was in a prayer meeting one night, and he, for some reason he had a hold of the sofa, and he lifted it up and lifted me and two other dudes straight up off the ground. In other words, he was physically strengthening himself, and it physically made him that he could carry himself and can pick up two others spiritually that's what we're to do we're to keep ourselves strong in the spirit that's the reason we go to the bible and read not just to check off a box to say but boy i read today not just to get in that monotonous thing no that somebody might need me to help carry them today so i need to go to the psalms or i need to go to the word and and get a word for myself that i can cast my weights and my sorrows there and god may be calling you to, to carry four or five somebody else's Maybe five, six, seven, eight others. And that's what he's saying here. Share the load. You which are spiritual, the same context is pulling. Help the, uh, those who's been overtaken. Help those who's overloaded. Carry the load. Why? Fulfilling the love of uh, It's the love of God. Fulfilling the law of Christ, which is love. The last thing he says here is to over-dramatized. Repeating, but for... Him that think in himself that he's something. Now that's someone that's a different, that's not that God's using and you're walking in your experience and those type of things. No, that's not what that's saying. That's someone uh, thinking himself is the word reputation. You know, he's the greatest in his own mind or her. And they're constantly putting out with spiritual overtones. Always telling people, I'm going to pray for you, man. I mean, uh, they're, they're spiritual, man. They, they love you because they pray for you all the time. Uh, now that the, could be a good thing. But see, a lot of people will say that verbally just to get it out there. And those are the things he's saying here. He's thinking himself when he is actually adding burdens. And it's the self-deception is a powerful thing. But let him prove himself of his own work. So I was speaking to a guy today, and he mentioned something. And, you know, the Lord's put a few guys in my life that, uh, that I'm able to help out, and I'm not just going to, you know, the Lord. And so I'm speaking to him. And I addressed this, this, this man today. You know, you do it, and, and I said, sir, you know, let me, let me ask you something. You know? And as we, you know, and you could tell that this, you know, hit, but the Bible says you prove yourself. And so when we was talking to him, let every man prove his own work. That means it's something he had already said, or this person's already said back up in verse number 3. And so that proving, it's setting the test, it's an exam, and then shall he have rejoicing. Really what we're doing when we're sharpening each other, and it's another reason you and I have to be uh, in the spiritual aspect, iron sharpeneth iron. And that we can sharpen each other. Why? Because that produces rejoicing in our life. Uh, a true rejoicing uh, for the over-dramatized. Every man shall bear his own burden. Another military term. For every man shall bear. So I wrote it down. Here's the Greek phrase that that is saying. Every man must shoulder his own pack. And that word burden there is freight. His own load. So here this... Carry your own load. If you're not carrying your own load, 
but you're going around acting like you're carrying this person's love and pray for you and pray for you, and your life all jacked up. No, you don't need to be praying for nobody. All right? You either go to, you say, I wouldn't say that. Well, that's exactly what Paul is saying. You prove yourself by carrying your own load. Then once you carry your own load, then you go and start reconciliation and you start overtaking. But if you're not carrying your own load, then you go trying to carry them. That's where a lot of stuff starts happening. And Paul is mentioning that. Shouldering his own pack. When that happens, then you have rejoicing. So let every man bear his own freight. Now, what a blessing that is. So if you're bearing your own freight, you know that you're in a place that you can bear others. And so what Paul was saying here, brethren, if any man, and so he's talking to the church of how to help each other get through this thing because there's a lot of casualties out there. And a lot of people, they make a mistake and they'll get rolled off and then they don't think there's any restoration. But yes, there is restoration. Aren't you glad for that? That we serve a God to the second, third, and the fourth chance? And so we serve a God who will restore. We serve a God who will strengthen and give us the strength to help carry other people's burdens. And then he allows us who are, uh, and you who are spiritual, because you're going to be on... One of these says, but if you're led in verse 18 of chapter 5, what that's telling me, and I'm wrapping up right here, is you can be spiritual today and fleshly tomorrow. You say, ain't no way I can. You can be spiritual today, but if ye are led. And Paul was saying, but if ye are led of the Spirit. And so we need to be led of the Spirit. We've got the Holy Spirit in us. And he's right there. And when we get to the word and he strengthens, and not by my might, not by my power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord, we can help those who's overtaken, overloaded, and overdramatic in the body of Christ. And it strengthens the overall body of Christ. Father, we thank you for your word tonight. Thank you how it's a lamp on our feet and a light under our path that we can look into it and draw from its vast wisdom. And so, God, we thank you for the, for the pages in Galatians chapter 6. Uh, help us see and hear what's not being said in people's lives. Help each one of us be led of the Spirit, be in a place that we can help the overtaken, the overloaded, and over-dramatized for the glory of God. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.